Have you ever been called a band geek, a theater nerd, cyber dork, studio rat, gamer punk, orchestra dork, book monkey, drama jock, poindexter, artsy fartsy, or just plain weird? Well then, welcome to Art Nerds. This is the podcast where we sit down with our nerdy friends, embrace our inner geek, and celebrate our art. Hello, my friends. This is Michael O'Brien, and welcome back to Art Nerds. This is the podcast where we get to talk to our nerdy friends about their artwork. And today, uh, via the internet, I have with me uh, Stephen Kennedy out of St. Louis. Stephen, how are you doing today? I'm great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing quite well. And I, again, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, I'm excited to hear from you. Uh, Stephen, go ahead and start us off. What is your art? I am a photographer, and I have been nearly as long as I've been walking. Really? I started out getting deep into it when I was about 13, and I really hit my stride at age 14, and I started working professionally when I was 15. Professionally in, in what capacity? I was a freelance photojournalist. Shortly after turning 15, I started working for the weekly newspaper in my hometown of Alton, Illinois. Oh, wow. Seriously, you were a journalist for the newspaper. I was. At 15 years old. That's correct. Hard to, <laughs> hard to believe. No, that's fantastic. My, my so persistence it... and maybe a little of their pity <laughs> merged simultaneously. And I started doing photo assignments for the weekly newspaper. Uh, just just local stuff, like local news? and It was exactly local. Uh, that newspaper was a free weekly paper that came out on Wednesdays. And I was doing exclusively sporting-related subjects. And I found out about six weeks into my tenure with them that the reason I was doing sports was that the staff photographer hated anything sporting related. <laughs> so you got stuck with it. Well, it was uh, it was like a winning lottery ticket. So I was thrilled. And uh, my first published picture came a week after it was promised to be published. And the subject was my high school classmate, a soccer player. That's great. And so, uh, so where did it go from there? Well, it, every day, every weekday, I would stop in at the newspaper. And it was conveniently located across the street from the city library in Alton, where I worked as it was my part-time job. So when my friends were flipping burgers or selling apparel or records at the mall, I was shelving books at the library. So every day I would walk into the newspaper before I walked into the library to remind them that I was alive and that I was dying to do any assignment that I could get my hands on. And that marketing push every day seemed to pay off. That seems to be the way to do it. Just show up and I'm still here. You still need yeah. me? Yeah. That's, but, and so was this a paid gig? It was a paid gig. I was paid $5 for every published photo. And I did that for just about a year. And then I walked in one day and they said, Stephen, we love you. You're a great photographer. We'd love to continue having you take pictures. However, we are not going to pay you anymore. And as I took that in, trying to understand what they said and also trying not to cry, I decided that I was just going to walk outside and get my wits about me. I stood there for a few minutes and then decided I was going to walk up the hill to the daily newspaper and present myself as a freelance photographer. 
The good news was I knew the staff photographers. And when I walked in and told them that story, they were livid. So they let loose with some insults of their air quote competition from down the street (laughs) and pulled off two assignments from the board and said, from now on, you're going to work for us. Wow. And I did that for two years before leaving for college. That's (laughs) That's <laughs> that, what a great story. They were the nicest guys and uh, had a such a profoundly positive influence in my development as a not just a photojournalist but as a photographer in whole. And. Uh, I continued to be a freelancer for them on and off when I was in college, but their generosity and their encouragement was a was a huge lift for me. Yeah, I would say so. Now I'm curious. Um, you you said they were a big boost to you and a big help learning how to be a photojournalist, and and beyond. What do you mean by the 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 beyond that? Well, my my foundation as a photographer was being a photojournalist. However, after college, uh, I graduated, got my diploma, and there are just very few full-time opportunities to be a photojournalist. And I was lucky enough to get a job as a staff photographer right out of college with Washington University in St. Louis. So that was really a kind of a hybrid position where I was half commercial photographer, half documentary photographer. So I I worked creating imagery for their catalogs for their marketing pieces and other communications. But that's when I kind of got a feeling that, well, there's more to life than photojournalism. And uh, that really, I, that, that was a fork in the road. And I moved to the commercial world from there. So, so did you start your own studio then or? Well, I, better than that, I I met a commercial photographer from Dallas who was doing some pro bono work for Washington University. He attended Washington U and was a a booster and a donor, and he donated his time to do a very large project and. The the genesis of that was I thought I was going to do that project and turned out that he volunteered to do it and I was I was crushed. So I was talking to a friend of mine who by that time who was a a an emerging commercial photographer and a bit of a straight shooter and he said you're not good enough for that project. You need to call this fellow from Dallas and tell him that you want to be his assistant on that project. And you need to watch and learn and see what he's doing. Well, I didn't want to hear that, but I, I was it. I was going to ask that it was at an insult to a certain degree. Well, I knew in my heart that this guy was right. So I, I called the photographer the next day and he was a really nice guy about it and said, Oh, I would welcome your help as an assistant. And we met a couple weeks later when this project started. And from the first five minutes of observing him at work, I knew that a, I knew very little and B this guy was the one who was going to teach me everything. At the end of our first day, I said, 
please let me come and be your assistant. And he said, well, let's just talk about this when this project's over in a couple of days. As luck would have it, his full-time assistant was getting ready to depart. And six weeks later, I had moved to Dallas and started working for this photographer as his assistant, which was an everyday 10 to 12 hours a day labor that was like uh, maybe an MFA. I was going to say, that sounds like an advanced, that sounds like grad school. It really was. It, it was the, the perfect apprenticeship that I could have ever dreamed of having. And I went on to work for him for about a year until I decided I had had learned enough and was ready to do my own thing. And that was 1989. And I moved to St. Louis and started my own studio. Wow. And I want to say, you, I, I, while you were talking, I was thinking in my head, what an amazing amount of luck. But, re, you know, also reviewing in my head, this, there's not a lot of luck in this other than you know, this one particular photographer, you're just tenacious. <laughs> I mean, you call people, you go there and that's amazing. I think, you know, there's, there's the, the two halves of me personally, where the nature of the work requires me to be confident and outgoing and out in the world. And then there's the other half that is somewhat introverted and somewhat um, complacent, and that's a daily that's a daily struggle that I think every artist can relate to. It's like, okay, well, what am I going to make today? I'd love to make something. Well, I'd really like it already to be made. <laughs> but that's really not going to work. So I, in fact, yesterday I had a a little personal kind of thing of forcing myself to do something. Okay. It appears today, well, this was me yesterday. It appears today is going to be the hottest day of the year. What, and it was what close. is, what do I need to do to force myself out of my comfort zone? First of all, this air conditioned room I'm in. <laughs> so I grabbed a camera. I went to downtown St. Louis. I parked myself at the corner of Washington Avenue and 13th Street. And I said, okay, for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to photograph everybody that walks by who gives me permission. And I asked nine people. And eight people said yes. And two people looked a little too scary for me to ask. So <laughs> I, I decided, well, I'm going to let them walk by. Uh, and that was just, that was a great personal exercise where I, I, I like to try to do that as often as I can. I think that's interesting because, uh, number one, I completely relate to the, I, you know, to the notion that I, if I don't have a project I'm currently working on, it's hard for me to uh, get down in the shot. You know, I, I'm a builder. I build props and scenery and puppets and things like that. And when I'm not working on a project, it's tough for me to come down to the shop and even care to be down here. But, uh, you know, but, but, but at, like you said, that once in a while, like, okay, I'm just going to make something, anything. And, you know, I've got a, several boxes full of bits and bobs and weird things that I've never finished. But eventually it's fun because they, I come back to them. When I do have a project I'm working on, I usually start rummaging around and find the bits and bobs that add to the bigger project. So I, I love the idea that um, that as as artists, and I think you're right about all artists have, struggle with this. You know, unless, you know, there's this one thing, it's hard to step up to it. Yeah. I think, I think artists 
need to make it easy on themselves to succeed on these low stakes fronts. So I think you have to have a system or a framework in place as an artist just to be able to go do something, even if it's small. Right. And habitualizing that makes it, it it goes from being an occasional success to a daily practice. And with those kinds of practices comes the incremental growth. And then when something magical happens, something, a big project or a eureka moment or just some happy accident that allows you to put all of that assembled experience Mm -hmm. in place makes those dramatic successes much more frequent. Agreed. Yeah, because it brings true because uh, I'm in the I I come from the theater arts. I come from theater, and I used to perform and all this good stuff. But I uh, I saw an article with Penn Jillette and Teller, Penn and Teller, and they said they they were confronted with the idea that they're the best magicians in the world, and they said we are now, we never were. And he, long story short, he he uh, he and Teller both talked about putting in the hours. And I think that's what you're talking about. Um, you know, I can be a great anything, but I got to put in the hours, you know, on stage, on, at the bench, build, you know, performing, building, whatever. But, and I think that's what you're talking about. You're habitually trying to find the habits to put in the hours to make yourself better and better and better. Cause you know, it's, it's one Lego brick in the giant castle every day. That's a great way to say it because I look at look back at my body of work and so much of it is is there because I kind of forced myself to get up and get out and and do it and uh, even within my and, I, and I've had phases of this with my commercial work. Uh, the 1990s, when I started as an advertising photographer, was was a, a time of of abundance and plenty. Because if you were a commercial photographer, once you got over the the craft barrier, once you knew how to do the craft. And if you were able to assemble a critical mass of equipment and or a studio space, then you had a business mm-hmm. because there was um, a the supply and demand curve at that moment in time favored the commercial artist. Well, that has completely changed, uh, and that is no longer the case. Commercial work is a completely different business now, uh, and that's has most everything to do with the digital process. When mm-hmm. I started, one had to have the ability to expose, process, deliver, whether that was in print or or finished transparency film. So you were still in dark rooms with the red light and the chemicals. Yes, and that that is something that I do not miss. I much <laughs> I much prefer the digital process and I much and I'm just thrilled that photography is now essentially a universal language that's because an oh, i'm sorry go ahead well you know if you don't speak another person's language and they see your pictures or if you communicate to the world via instagram it's uh 
there, there's no language barrier there. It's a, it's a remarkable transformation that I never would have dreamed of as, as a young photographer. Right. No, but you know, the, the picture's worth a thousand words, but <clears throat> the notion that the digital age has turned photography into a full-blown language and not just a, a smaller art form. I, that's, ha that's how I see it. And, it, and, and it, it's the same for, for film and video. When you think about how, um, you know, there are so many hours spent on TikTok by viewers seeing mm -hmm. these, these short form. I mean, let's, I think we should call them films because when you think about what it, you, what used to be involved to make a 15 second motion picture, it was still the same kind of equipment that was required to make a feature film and right. now you can do it on your phone and you can communicate that way and it's 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 remarkable right but i'm intrigued by the, uh it is remarkable and this podcast is a product of that you know uh me getting into radio at such a late age you know 20 30 40 years ago would have been ridiculous well, you would have had to 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 get through the gatekeeper, and right. um, mainstream radio wouldn't be interested in a couple of artists talking. You might find a niche somewhere in public radio or community mm -hmm. radio that might air at three uh, thirty a.m. or something like this. But, right, but just I mean, even me having the equipment to do this. That's right. I think is a big change, but I, but I'm still. I love the idea. I love that notion that, um, that photography and the visual arts have become a more prom, if not a new language or an added language, certainly a more prominent part of the way we communicate. Well, just think about how you use your phone for the camera in your phone for daily tasks. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, let me take a picture of this package because I know I'm going to the grocery store or <laughs> let me take a picture. Uh, you know, I'm doing a repair here. Let me take a picture of that right. bolt pattern before I, <laughs> right. I disassemble that. And it's, it's, How many times have I called home? Would you photograph the grocery list? to me because I forgot it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But yeah, that's, uh, I love that. I, Cause I, you know, um, it's interesting cause again, I come from the theater and I'm not a big film person, but I love silent film and I love the old silence and that kind of the silent pictures like that. Um, and this is you know, how you describe this is all ringing very, very true and very, I don't know, to, you know, it's, it, it's, it's part of my heart at this point. So, <laughs> so I, I, I think that's really, uh, and I, you've got me stumbling because I'm thinking about it. So congratulations. Well, you know, what you said about, um, silent film, silent film was silent because of the constraints of the technology, the motion picture camera mm -hmm. at the time was visual only right and the making a motion picture was a different kind of stage performance so the actors in the early motion picture world were former and existing stage actors mm-hmm and then as the technology changed, then the, then the art form changed. When sound came in, all of a sudden, uh, the silent actors had to speak. And some of them weren't really, uh, you know, weren't what you would consider uh, 
their audio performance did not equal their visual performance. Right. You know, you get movies like Singing in the Rain that kind of document that process. Exactly. And yeah, then yeah. we have this evolution and now we all of us have a tool of creation in our back pocket that by comparison is staggering and in its capabilities and you know, now the does, fo- go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was, I was gonna, does that bother you as a professional photographer that everybody can take these kind of pictures or are you in, is it part of your arsenal now or? It doesn't bother me. However, I have seen peers in the commercial world who find that to be uh, a real and almost existential threat and we're not shy about sharing that opinion but you know time moves forward and Mm -hmm. you can't lock yourself in amber and the digital process has allowed me to do things in a way that i could have never imagined i haven't shot any film since 2002 (laughs) and once i got my first digital camera i knew i would never go back and that technological advance unleashed an entirely new business for me that started in about 2004 i started creating self-financed and self-produced photo sessions for the purposes of licensing the images as stock photography. Really? Yes. And it all started on a professional paid gig that uh, was in San Francisco. I was doing a, a commission job and we had worked with a casting agent to identify five subjects for some print ads. And the casting agent provided us with what turned out to be an embarrassment of riches of acting talent. So we picked the people for the paid commission project. And I still had all of these other people that I thought, Oh my gosh, I would love to take this picture, person's picture just to do it. And through a kind of a, a lucky moment, I, I decided, well, you know what? I can, I'm already in San Francisco. These people live here. I'm going to be here for a week. Why don't I contact them and um, see if we can do something that's not this job? And the first person I contacted seemed agreeable. So I paid this person a, uh, a photo fee and she met me just, I said, well, let's just go down on Fisherman's, Fisherman's Wharf. And we spent about 30 minutes doing a brief street photography session. And I paid her and she signed a model release and I promised to share the pictures with her. And at the end of the day, I thought, Well, I just, this is a stock photo session. I can, you know, that, that's what this is. And I just started doing it over and over and over again. And over the course of about eight years, I did about 1250 (laughs) of these, um, photo sessions and I optimized it and I would shoot in New York and LA and London um, and then pl- all points in between. I worked and would go to Florida in the winter when it was cold at home. And then I created my own um, vertically integrated company where I would produce and I would distribute and I would sell and I would do this all direct. And wow. So that uh, that was a very viable business for me for about ten years. That's been and it, uh, and like you said, this was all 
as a result, I mean, could you, you couldn't have done this prior to the digital age. Correct. Am I correct? You, you, you are right because the cost, the production cost would have been staggering. Sure. A then, typical, yeah. a typical, fi- a, a photo session back in the 1990s would typically involve almost a thousand dollars of film and processing and Polaroid and production. So my, when I had my studio, my biggest, as a film photographer, my biggest line item uh, was not my studio rent. It was my materials cost and my lab bill. That's, so I, I spent more money every month at the photo lab than I did my studio rent. Right. Yeah, that's very enlightening. I mean, I'm not, I know very little about your business, but that's very interesting that it changed so drastically. Did it change quickly in terms of well, film to well, digital or for you anyway? Like a lot of other film photographers, I struggled with what I thought would be a digital transition. Uh, but the reality was once I finished my first digital shoot, uh, I knew I would never go back to film. So right. I was going to, you know, maybe do half film, half digital. And I, it's like, okay, well, this is just, it, it's, <laughs> it was the difference between, uh, you know, uh, a push mower and a riding mower. I mean, it was really that, <laughs> that profound. It was, it was that clear, the choice. Yes. <laughs> well, and, and then like all other kinds of things in my career, the, the, the stock business um, had a, had a sunset time too. There was the marketplace changed dramatically and um so I, I kind of, I haven't done any new stock creation really since um, the, the pandemic was, was kind of the, the mm. logical stopping point. But then I was struggling with, well, what am I going to do next? And I have this muscle memory of creation of... Okay, well, I'm I'm used to being out at least once a week to produce a some kind of a photo session, and I I, I struggled with well, what's next? And fortunately, I came to uh, to find a new outlet, and I I found that in 2021 which is a documentary project, which I'm, I'm in deep now. So it's a, it's, it's a documentary photography project in which I hope to go to all 50 States and photograph artists in their places of creation, in their studios. I was hoping we were going to get to this. Yeah. Cause we were, cause I'm looking at your website. Uh, about the about this project and it's beautiful it's stunning well thank you very much yeah and it, it's it's the it's everything i've learned up to this point that that really again starts at my foundation as a photographer i was a a, a, a photojournalist is a is is typically in the way that I practiced it. I was, I was documenting life in, in very narrow moments. So what I'm doing now is a documentary photo essay of an artist and doing their thing where it really, it brings everything together. So it's, right. It's them in their studio. It's a, it's about their place in the world in a specific moment. So these are 
pictures in 2021, and now there are pictures in 2022. And it brought me back to really what I, I loved initially as a photographer. I'm creating a document of that moment in time. And in this case, right. these are very, very extended um, representations of these moments. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I have to comment on this while we're kind of talking about the, the, the in the moment situations that you're capturing and, and it's, they're very much in the moment. Every last one of them, it looks like, um, I, cause when we set up the interview for art nerds, I immediately, you know, you gave me your, uh, your web pages and things like that. And what I recognized at least right off the bat for me is that every photograph you've at least, at least you put on, uh, put online, every person, every face is absolutely beautiful. And I don't just mean that in terms of quality of photography, but just quality of human being. Every person looks attractive and lovely. And I want to know each and every one of these people just by these quick little photographs, these quick snippets of life. It's amazing. Well, you and I both know the joy that can accompany the moment of creation. Mm -hmm. So when you are deep into your process, I am certain that that is one of the happiest times of your day. Absolutely. That you, and that is what I seek to capture with these people these other artists, these men and women from, uh, you know, these different points on the map. And uh, to, to be in their, in their presence, observing them at work, they just can't help but, you know, in, enjoy their, their moment of creation. Right. And the other thing that really makes me happy about these finished essays is that it can can kind of hold up a mirror to the world to say oh this is this is what a a painter's life is oh this is what a printmaker does Oh, this is this is the sculptor with his finished pieces spinning in the wind of right. Idaho, and to to be a bit of a roadmap to maybe someone who might be on the bubble about pursuing, you know, or directing a bit of their life to. The creation of of art I, th I and i think that that's what attracts me because all of these people are, are at least you know most of these people are artists in your essays and in your websites and these people and um they you know there's nothing similar in terms of their situation it looks like their studio space their creation process their attitude toward their work seems to be different in every photograph. And I think that's what's one of the absolute uh, joys that I'm getting out of your work in that, um, you know, you, you're very much uh, showing the world that art is as, as individual as these people and every process is different. And I'm so glad you're on the sh on the podcast because I think part of my I'm realizing I think part of this podcast is to show the same thing, you know, the, the very you know how human it is versus how different it is versus how universal it is on the same level, you know. You're right, and it still surprises me sometimes when I 
you know, I'll contact an artist that I think is a, a, a really ideal candidate for this project. And, um, you know, we'll make arrangements for the photo session and, uh, you know, I've seen their work online. We've, we've maybe had at least a, a long email chain, probably supplemented with one or two phone calls. And then I'll get there and say, oh, this is just a, a million times better than I could have imagined. <laughs> right. Uh, I had such a great experience in early May. I, I met an artist in Grenada, Mississippi. And I got to her studio and it was, you know, I had seen pictures of her, her space. It's, it's a, um, it's a mixed both gallery and creation space. Uh, so her work was on display in the front and it was in this, you know, this charming part of, uh, the city square of, of Grenada, Mississippi. And, I'm looking at the work and I'm looking at her materials and we get to talking and I I see some, what appeared to be some science projects where it's like, Oh, these, these are organic leaves and roots and um, extractions. And I said, so tell me a little bit about this. And she said, well, most of my materials come from a cypress swamp, which is about three miles away. Would you like to go there and take some pictures? And I said, let's go Heck now. Yeah. <laughs> so we finished the session in her studio and then we drove a little bit outside of town and we walked into the swamp and finished finished the the photography session there and it was just it was the greatest moment that you that i could have imagined having on a weekday okay well (laughs) look look what i get to do we've 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 had the the inside shot and now here we are outside and the the birds are chirping and the bullfrogs are croaking and the wind is rustling the leaves and it it was it, it was fantastic and to be to have that kind of creative smorgasbord in front of me was astonishing but also i i still hold that with me now as a point of inspiration and sure. you know now that i've i've done i've done 21 i've done 51 artists in 23 states. Wow. And um, it's just, it's remarkable. The, the last session was on Saturday, a plein, plein air painter who lives in Manhattan. And we got a canvas and we got his paints and he walked to a corner on the upper west side of Manhattan and he set up his easel. He put the canvas up and he started creating this painting of a street scene. And all I had to do was stand back and watch as the canvas comes to life and people stop and they look at his canvas and they immediately see, Oh, this is what he's painting. He's paint. You can see the pizza right. sign. You can see the window. You can see the bus stop. You can see the people walking. And the greatest moments were when an adult with a kid walking by and the parent says, oh, see, look what he's doing. And then I thought, how can it top this? Five minutes later, a little girl with her dad, she stops dead in her tracks, grabs her dad's hand and says, dad, look, see, he's painting this and that's that. And it was, it was magic. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to imagine it in my head and I'm excited with you <laughs> just listening to you talk about it, let alone having been there. Now for you, let me ask you this is, um, is part of the art, your art is part of it getting to watch other artists or see other artists at work? Well, that, you know, that is the, uh, that's the happy accident of the project that I would have never um, imagined would be, would become the fuel to move the project forward. Because, because now when you think about the impediments of life that it's like, oh, how am I going to produce a photo session of an artist in Michigan? That's a state I haven't been to yet. And, um, well, how, you know, when am I going to do it? How am I going to get there? Who am I going to get? Now, I, it's just like, why am I sitting around doing nothing when I can go produce a, sh a session in Michigan? <laughs> get, get up, get get your act together and and do it. So it, it really is a fuel for the, the project. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would imagine so. I mean, I like to watch other artists work regardless of what they're doing, you know, whether it be, you know, fine art paint or leather or, you know, blacksmith, you know, what have you. Right. But, um, but also a uh, follow-up question, uh, again, inspired by the story of the Manhattan street corner session um, is part of your now project. Is it also part, is it also the human interaction? And then not, and I mean, not just with the artist, I'm sure that's part of it, but there's more to it. You know, it's, it's, it's watching the artist interact with other humans as well. Other people. Again, that's a real benefit. Uh, the way I work as a photographer is completely solo and, uh, you know, I don't, no crew, no assistant. And compared to many of my peers, I am very much a minimalist. I work with um, smaller format cameras. I uh, kind of do everything on the fly. My equipment footprint is as minimal as it possibly could be so that those things don't become barriers to to the moment. And, Interesting, yeah. Because you don't work um, out of a studio either. I no longer work out of a studio. In fact, I haven't had a studio since the 1990s. But getting back to what you were saying is – you know, I'm based in St. Louis. I have an office in my house, no studio. And if I'm not out in the field, I am rather isolated. You know, I communicate with um, people, you know, emails and and such. And I, I have some close friends that are photographers and, and we we stay in touch with calls and texts. To, you know, not only as a social mm -hmm. thing, but also, you know, to, to kind of check in with, with each other creatively. Sure. Um, and to, you know, sometimes prod each other along. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I will say that these personal interactions with what start off as strangers and then have now, uh, become, you know, you, you can't help but, become very almost intimately acquainted with an artist once you've spent some time in their workspace. Uh, these, these have been, have been great opportunities for this kind of, uh, uh, you know, at, at least social. And then in some cases we've, uh, a couple of artists and I have become friends and that's, I mean, that's great. How, how do you, you can't have too many friends. And, and when you think, especially in the midst of the pandemic and 
we've all been been isolated and Mm -hmm. all of us can use more interaction right and i I, and i love the idea that also it's um how many people are out there that you don't know who could easily be your friends simply because through the artwork right you know and i that's the part i think um we're all trying to grasp as artists at least i am too as well i like this podcast um I got in contact with you through another friend, and this has been amazing. Uh, this this talk, um, we are we're getting close to the end here. Um, I want to ask. I've got a few like James Lipton kind of questions for the end. Um, what about your artwork really turned you on? I have to say that there is still the absolute thrill of seeing the finished image emerge before my eyes. In in the old days, that happened in the dark room, and now that happens on the, the screen on the back of the camera. It shows up, and I see it. It's like, oh, I made this. I just made this. <laughs> and I get to keep it. And I can do it again. And I can maybe make it better next time. And, um, you, you know, it's just, I never get tired of that. Every photograph. Well, almost every one. Anything about your artwork turns you off? Wow. You know, cuz you seem to be really in love with your artwork and I will not disparage that in any way shape or form. But I'm curious, is there something that just doesn't ring true? I guess I have, you know, carved such a deliberate path over what has been decades of practice to to kind of wall off the negative aspects that might have you know that might turn into an impediment and um i i will say that there are struggles with the craft that um that really don't exist as much in the digital realm as they they did with film. Uh, so I get I get the you know the emotional jolt of seeing the finished piece with no delay, but then there's still the po- there's still some post production work that has to be done, and I I find that a challenge after it you know the buzz is worn off. It's like oh. Now I've got some real, I've got some tedious work to have to do. So I take no joy in the digital um, post-production aspect of it. And I would say that um, to the point of where I, that that is really one realm of procrastination for me is that, um, okay, well, we just, we were bathing in the afterglow of the photo session <laughs> and um you know, now it's three days later. It's like, hey, yeah, you really need to get those files done. <laughs> you need to put them up on the website. You need to do the caption. You need to, you know, provide the artist statement. So there, there is that that right. becomes a little sometimes so, some drudgery. Yeah, the fun part's done, but then you got to get it out. Yeah. <laughs> is there any art form that you haven't dabbled in that you would like to? Well, you know, I started five years ago, I started writing a daily blog. I um, was inspired by Seth Godin. Uh, I took some um, online seminar extended classes with with Seth Godin's operation. Mm -hmm. And that became the writing of that daily blog 
became a supplemental creative practice, an adjunct to my photography. It, it's still a it's still a photography focused blog, and I have to I'm proud to say I've done um, more than 1,700 days in a row without missing. Wow. Uh, wow. It starts with a photograph. I will pull a photograph from my archive or from my phone, and then I will write, I don't know, 50 to 200 words. And um, it's a real... It's a real thrill to be able to to publish that every day because I know how hard it used to be. It was it was nearly impossible for an individual to publish short of making a a, a photocopy and mm-hmm. putting it in a in an envelope and stamp and sticking it in a mailbox. Um I can, I can do that every day and it's, it focuses me in the moment at a certain time every day. And, you know, people subscribe to it and I feel like I owe it to myself and I owe it to my readers. But getting back to what you said, maybe some longer form writing. Okay. Maybe the art form that may be something for me down the road. Interesting. Is there an art form that you know you would never want to get into? I, you know, I have uh, a lot of my peers are very much into using their digital cameras to create short form video pieces. And that has never held any attraction to me. And I've seen some very good work in that genre, but that is nothing that really appeals to me. Like, uh, like moving pictures, movies, TikTok, that kind of Correct. stuff. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. You got it. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. One absolute last question. Um, where can we see some of your art? I'm most proud of the current project, which is called Cross Country Camera. And that really has my nearly 100% of my attention. And that really shows everything that I want the world to see of me. And that's at crosscountrycamera.com. Right. And that's the, that's the same site I've been talking about throughout the podcast. Uh, the, all of these beautiful faces and these wonderful uh, situations. So yeah, I highly recommend uh, this website. And I will put all these links down in the descriptors wherever this goes out. Any place else? Uh, well, my blog can be seen every day at stephenkennedy.com. Okay. Cl- click on the blog tab. Okay. So uh, all right, if I put these... Uh, sites in the descriptors. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Stephen, I can't thank you enough. This has been uh, a real insight for me. I love uh, love this kind of discussion where you know y- your heart comes out and your philosophies come out. So I appreciate you coming, uh, taking the time with me today. I really well, do. Th- thank you very much. It's great to talk to another kindred spirit. And yeah. um, uh, I look forward to uh, future interactions. Yeah, me too. I hope we can stay in touch. This is great. Thanks for hanging around and geeking out with us. If you enjoyed the show, hit the like and subscribe buttons. And more importantly, join the conversation and leave us a message or comment. We'd love to hear about your nerdy art. Thanks again, and join us next week for more Art Nerds.